Hello, everybody, and welcome to this um, presentation of Horry County Fire and Rescue Magnet Project. One of the things, just to give you an overview of what we're doing and what's to come, uh, we've had several incidents of patients in the county that were transported that had uh, faulty wiring or issues with their uh, defibrillators and their pacemakers, and it was enough of a um, significant incidence, in, incidence that um, Dr. Goebel, who is the electrophysiologist with Grand Strand Regional Medical Center, and Ryan, Ryan Banning, who is the uh, representative from Medtronic, who also works at Grand Strand Regional Medical Center, have decided that they want to push having the paramedics in the field actually administer the cardiac magnet to the patient. Uh, the goal here is to alleviate the needless pain that these uh, patients are receiving by getting these shocks. And what we're going to talk about today is when to use the magnet, when not to use the magnet, and how that affects what we currently do with our cardiac patients. Uh, and then we'll go over the protocol and the things that Dr. Goebel would like us to accomplish uh, and keep in mind when we're taking care of these patients. So let's get started. Again, my name is Patrick Ellis. Um, I am Assistant Chief Givens Assistant. I have also been working very heavily with Ryan Banning on this project and Dr. Goebel um, and Debbie Kirkman out of Grand Strand Regional Medical Center to get this accomplished. So let's go through the PowerPoint now. Some of the objectives we want to be um, familiar with by the end of this course is, again, review anatomy and physiology of the heart. We have to understand what's normal in the heart to really understand what's going on with these uh, defibrillators, ICDs, and these pacemakers, uh, and why that when there's something going on, how to recognize it uh, with our patient and ultimately with our EEG. So having an understanding, a basic understanding of anatomy and physiology of the heart is going to be important. Uh, we need to be familiar with the ICDs and the pacemakers and the purpose that each device has and how they work. Uh, I think a lot of you... Um, I know I was when I first uh, was introduced to this lecture and when I received the training uh, from Ryan, I was very shocked at some things I didn't know uh, or some things that have progressed in you know, the field of making these ICDs and pacemakers that I didn't know was taking place. So we want to touch on that and make sure you're familiar with what they do and how they work and how the magnet's going to affect that device. I want you to be able to explain how each of these devices improve the quality of life for the patient, understand how the use of the donut magnet can greatly improve the quality of care we provide as EMS professionals, and last, be familiar with DHEC's recommendations and your local protocols. All right, let's start with the anatomy and physiology of the heart and some of the cardiac dysrhythmias that are associated that we may see, okay? Normal heart function, we know that the normal average heart rate for an adult is 60 to 100 okay we know that the atriums and the or the top portions of the heart and they contract first followed by the ventricles these two chambers give us the sound of love dub a lot of you that went to paramedic school remember hearing about the love dub all right this is caused by the opening and closing of the heart valves all right the love that we hear is actually the closure of the av valves or the mitral or tricuspid valves the dub we hear is closure of the aortic of the pulmonary valves. All right. This is your normal heart. All right. Now, talking about the devices, that was a quick overview, but it's the basics. It's all we really need to be concerned about right now. Most of y'all are familiar with the flow of the heart and how having abnormalities with each one of those chambers or each one of those valves can cause problems. We're not really concerned about that. I'm concerned with the normal flow of the heart. Okay. Now let's talk about some devices. There are different devices out there, different ICDs, different pacemakers, different companies that produce them. Um, but let's talk about each one in particular and what it does. All right. Your pacemaker, a permanent pacemaker, these devices only keep the heart rate above a program limit, usually between 60 and 70 beats per minute. So basically you have a patient who, for whatever reason, all right, 
is not maintaining that normal heart rate. Okay, so they have to install the pacemaker to maintain the 60 to 70 beats per minute. Keep this in mind because it's going to become very important when we apply the donut magnet. ICDs, or your defibrillators, these devices are designed to treat deadly arrhythmias. Okay, now, can you have a combination of the two in a patient? Most certainly. All right, you can have an ICD slash pacemaker. You can have just a pacemaker. You can also have just an ICD. In just a little bit, I'm going to cover how do I recognize the two? How do I know this patient has an ICD and a pacemaker combination? Okay, we'll get into that. All right, by these, these are devices that help heart failure symptoms. Um, they can be either ICDs or pacemakers in there. Again, we'll talk more about that as we go on with the program. All right, here's a picture of the devices. Okay, you can see um, that notice that your devices that are bigger, the two on the left and right, and then you have the one in the center. Uh, one of them is a pacemaker and the other two are ICDs. Okay, now your pacemaker is usually the smaller of the two. When you have the ICD, it requires a little bit more of a power source or a little bit more of some energy, so they're going to be bigger, especially if you have multiple devices where you have the ICD and the pacemaker together. Be familiar with this because most of the time you can look at the patient's chest and you'll see the bulge where the device is located. The bigger the bulge, you can be able to tell which device that is. Okay. What is an arrhythmia? An arrhythmia is any abnormal heart rhythm. Uh, dangerous arrhythmias occur when the ventricle becomes fast and jeopardizes blood flow to vital organs to, to the rest of the body. Okay. Now, when we talk about dangerous arrhythmias, we're talking about VTAC, VFib. Um, it could be maybe a rapid V or AFib, um, SVT. Those are certain things that we're concerned about as we call dangerous arrhythmias. These arrhythmias are usually in the ventricle since the ventricles are the main pumping chamber of the heart. So we're specifying VTAC and VFib because they're a ventricular um, rhythm. All right. AFib uh, is most likely going to be an atrium rhythm. So just keep that in mind. Some of these lethal rhythms are called VTAC and VFib, just like we mentioned. All right. We're going to talk about VTAC. There are many fast rhythms. Some of these rhythms can be lethal and some cannot be lethal. Uh, we know that VFib and VTAC could be lethal. Um, sinus TAC, atrial fib with RVR, SVT may or may not be lethal. Most of the time they're not, um, but they have the potential to be if not treated effectively. All right. Zones. The device is set to what we call zones for fast rhythms. Uh, most devices are divided into two zones. Some patients may have one. This is determined based on the patient, the cardiologist, and the electrophysiologist. They decide how many zones and how the device is set up. The zone is set to recognize a fast rhythm. For example, if the zone is set at 170, the device will start making decisions at the rate of 170. So to sum it up, um, your patient may with all the physicians together decide that they need to set the rate to 170. So unless the rhythm gets above 170, the device is not going to recognize it. So if you have atrial fib and it's RVR and it only gets up to 150 or 160, the device is not set to react to that. Okay, This is very important when we start talking about applying the magnet. Um, and it also is important, for example, when you have an ICD, you can have the potential to have VTAC and not get above 170. We'll talk about that. So the device is not going to catch it. A lot of people ask me, well, Patrick, you know, if they have a defibrillator in them, uh, can we shock on top of that? And we'll talk about that more later. But yes, because the device might not recognize the rhythm because the rate is lower than what the zone is set for. All right, we'll talk more about that in a second, but this is just to give you an understanding of, you know, these zones. So, decisions. What decisions are made when the heart becomes fast? Is the person exercising? Is the heart trying to keep up with the AFib? Is there something I need to treat? The device also stores templates of waveforms and will compare the waves to determine if they are lethal or normal rhythm. That's interesting and that's something new. 
So what we would consider to be normal VTAC, or not really nothing normal about it, but when we look at an EKG rhythm and we see VTAC, they basically store that in the device. So the device can recognize certain parameters of that rhythm and say that, based on these parameters, are VTAC. Just like when we learned in paramedic school that this is what we call sinus rhythm. It has a P wave, it has a QRS, it has a T wave. Uh, there's certain measurements for each one. It's the same theory. So these devices are set to recognize, based on the criteria, that rhythm. So these things are becoming very, very smart, um, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Sinus TAC. Uh, we all know what sinus TAC is. That's basically normal sinus rhythm at a very high rate, um, usually about 110, 120. Uh, when exercising, the increase in heart rate has a gradual onset, meaning you have to work to get the heart rate to go fast, and then your heart will gradually start to slow down. The device looks to see if the onset of a faster rate is gradual or sudden, and is it regular. The device also compares the template to see if it is a normal rhythm. Once the device sees the heart rate in the zone and makes the decision that, that this is sinus tag due to exercise, the therapy will be held until there is a change to support a lethal rhythm. So in other words, if I decide that, you know, I just got a pacemaker, I just got an ICD placed in, and I decide all of a sudden I'm going to go run on a treadmill, uh, and I get my heart rate up past the zone. Let's say I'm on the treadmill and my heart rate is 200, for example. It's going to recognize, A, that it was a slow onset. It wasn't the heart was just sitting there and I'm resting in a recliner and all of a sudden I go into VTAC, which would be a sudden uh, it recognizes the fact that my heart rate slowly increased. It also is going to look at that and say, okay, yeah, it's above 170, but look at the rhythm itself. Look at the parameters that was set for sinus tack. Does it match that parameter? And it's going to recognize that and say, okay, even though it's above 170, I'm not going to shock it because I'm recognizing that, A, it's sinus tack, and it was a gradual onset. All right, so I hope everybody understands the importance of that. All right. AFib with RVR. All right. With AFib with RVR, the rhythm is irregular. Okay. Once again, the device takes a look at the rhythm in the zone and checks for onset, regularity, is it a one-to-one -one ratio, and the wavelet template, All right. which means what it has been designed to recognize as AFib, is that truly meeting the same parameters? The device recognizes the rhythm is irregular and will hold on to therapy since this is not a lethal rhythm. If there is a change in the rate of rhythm, the analysis begins again to determine if the therapy is needed. So let's say this patient, you know, most of you know that if you see AVF, um, AF with RVR, most of you know that sometimes it can be so fast that we have a hard time determining whether it's SVT or atrial fib. So most of us will do a 12 lead to see that. Well, basically the device is doing the same thing. It's going to try to determine is this AFib with RVR? Is it SVT? What's going on with this patient? Okay, and if, let's say, it recognizes that it is AFib with RVR, so it doesn't shock the patient, it's, and then something changes. Let's say the patient all of a sudden goes into VTAC. Okay, it will then analyze it again and say, okay, well, this is now VTAC. These are my parameters. I need to react and treat this patient accordingly. Okay. So that's how this device works. The device recognizes the rhythm is lethal. We're talking about VTAC and VFIP. Um, most of the times, these rhythms have a ventricular or A, which means the ventricles, which are the bottom chambers, are going at a rate of 200 beats per minute. And the atrium, the top chambers, is going at a rate along 60 to 100 like nothing is happening. Wavelet templates are different, also indicate that there is a lethal rhythm. So the gist of this uh, PowerPoint slide is just to let you know that these are the parameters that were set for what is VTAC and what is VFib. It's going to know the difference in the rhythms and it's going to react accordingly. Okay, let's review. All right. Decisions made by the device include wavelet templates. All right, is there a change? Is this a normal rhythm? If it determines that if it's a normal rhythm, did it change to a lethal rhythm when it recognizes that there is a change in this? Um, 
ventricles are faster than the atrial, so then it recognizes the lethal rhythm. What it's saying there is, is that most of the time in VTAC and VFib, that's a ventricular rate. It's a ventricular set. It's all in the ventricles. Okay, so it's going to recognize, wait a minute, my ventricles, because I'm in VTAC, are pumping at this rate higher than the atrium. Okay, it's got a preset parameter for that. Is it regular? Is it irregular? And how did it come on? Was it a quick onset? Was it a really sudden onset like you would normally see in VTAC? Uh, was this patient exercising? So, or just for a brisk walk? Or was it an emotional response? All this stuff is put into this device. This is no longer something that says, okay, we're just going to shock and that's all that's going to happen. Or I'm just going to sit here and pace at a certain rate. These things have become very smart to determine what's going on. Little computers that are going to evaluate a lot of stuff in that patient determine what's going on. Okay, so I hope you have gained again or at least reminded yourself of the basic knowledge of these rhythms and again what these devices are designed to do and what they're capable of doing. It's going to become very important in recognizing what's going on with this patient and whether or not we need to implement the donut magnet or whether or not we need to just treat like we would normally treat or in some cases whether we just need to leave it alone okay and make contact with medical control. All right now Let's talk about what we're all designed in this lecture to be, the cardiac donut magnet. All right, I'm very excited that this is rolling out. Um, having the privilege of looking at the reports and getting involved with the uh, cardiologist at Grand Strand Regional Medical Center and Debbie Kirkland, who is overseeing the cardiac department there, there is a huge demand for this. And I think this is going to not only benefit the patient, but it's going to give us, Horry County Fire and Rescue, more resources to improve the quality of care for our patients. So let's get into this. Let's talk about the magnet operation, what it's designed to do. All right. First of all, your ICD. The big question everybody has is, is when this ICD is doing it, how does the donut magnet affect the ICD? Well, if your ICD is firing or your ICD is just sitting in there and you were to place this donut magnet on top of the ICD, it will dis suspend all detection and therapy, which means the ICD is no longer sensing and treating arrhythmias. So, for example, if you were to have a patient in front of you that went into VTAC, all right, the ICD, if working properly, is designed to say, hey, the parameters are meant for VTAC, this patient's in VTAC, I need to react and start shocking the patient. If you place the donut magnet on top of the ICD, it no longer has the ability to sense or treat the arrhythmia. So the patient's going to be in VTAC and he's not going to be shocked. Okay. Now, why is that important to know? It's important to know because what we're trying to determine with the magnet, is this patient receiving a shock from the ICD because it's doing its job, or is it receiving a shock from the ICD because of faulty wiring? Okay, If it's receiving faulty wiring, then we're going to look on the monitor and we're going to see a normal sinus rhythm. We're going to see sinus tack at a low rate. We're going to see something that would normally not require the patient to be shocked. However, the patient is going to be shocked. That's why we want to put the magnet on top of the ICD, and what the magnet's going to do is it's going to cut off all sensing, and the ICD is not going to be able to treat the rhythm. The problem that we may encounter is, is this patient may have started off with, say, a fractured wire in the device, which is causing the patient to get shocked. We put the magnet on the patient, and all of a sudden the patient goes into VTAC. Well, now the ICD, because you have blinded it with the magnet, is not able to detect the rhythm. So what do we do? Very simple. We take the magnet off the chest and allow the ICD to do what it's designed to do. It's that simple. Okay. Now, before we move any further, let's discuss the pacemaker. All right. Now, basically, the pacemaker we all know is designed to pace at a set rate. We talked about that earlier. All right, usually 60 to 70, okay? So what happens is, is once we place the ICD, or excuse me, the, car, the magnet on top of the pacemaker, what it's going to do is it's going to automatically cause it to pace without sensing. And there's different rates, depending on the device, 
depending on what brand it is, whether it's Medtronic, Biotech, um, St. Jude, depending on the device, each one of them has a factory style setting that it goes to. So you're going to automatically get that setting once you put the magnet. Again, remember, it's not going to stop the pacemaker from working. It's just going to change the setting of that pacemaker. It's going to go back to a standard, basic, as if you were resetting your computer to a factory setting. All right, And that's important to know because we're still going to see pacer spikes. We're still going to see the pacemaker operating on our ECG. And we'll talk more about that in a second. All right. Mad interaction with pacemakers. Medtronic pacemakers versus magnet function paces the patient without sensing. Okay. Now, I don't want to get into the AOO, VOO, DOO. All those are different settings that the lecture physiologist and the Medtronic rep get into. That's another lecture. All right. Just know that their standard rate is 85 beats per minute. All right. Now, if 65 beats per minute, the pace maker needs to be replaced. Okay, so we don't need to get into that, but I just want you to know. So what's going to happen is, is let's say the patient's pacemaker is set at 70. Okay, they felt like when they put the pacemaker in initially that the pacemaker needed to be set at 70 to effectively treat the patient. Okay, well now all of a sudden the pacemaker ICD combo, the ICD is firing the patient. Okay, and it's not supposed to be. So you as the paramedic step in, you grab your donut mani, you place it on top of the device to eliminate the ICD from shocking the patient. What's going to happen to the pacemaker is, is it's going to go from 70 beats per minute to 85 beats per minute if it's strong and still has a good source. All right, now, if the pacemaker is not good, it's going to go from 70 to 65. Now, I know this may be confusing, it's just a need to know. Does it affect anything you do for that patient? No, not at all. You're still going to treat the patient accordingly. You're still going to be relieving the pain from getting shocked from this patient. That's just a little tidbit of FYI information. Okay. Now, you also have the potential of hearing audible tones when the pacemaker sets. So some devices, depending on the brand, depending on the manufacturer, some have tones, some have whistling, some of them have any noise at all. Okay, Just be aware that when you place the magnet on that patient, you may potentially, with the Medtronic here, beeping, audible tones. It doesn't mean you've done anything wrong. It's just part of the device. Okay. Now, the good news is, is let's say the pacemaker is set to 70. You put the donut magnet on the ICD pacemaker combo to blind the ICD so it doesn't shock the patient. Your pacemaker goes from 70 to 85 beats per minute because you just set it to the factory setting. The cool thing is, once you remove the magnet, the pacemaker will recognize, become back to where it was set, and it'll drop down to 70 again. It'll go right back to where it was designed to be. So that's the cool thing about these devices. They're very, very smart. Um, so just to regroup, the donut magnet, the only thing it does with the ICD, if you have just the ICD in the patient, it just blinds it. That's all it does. It cannot recognize, it cannot sense any uh, arrhythmias, it can't shock, it can't do anything. You've just completely blindfolded the ICD. The pacemaker is going to revert back to a factory setting okay and this is with the donut magnet on once you remove the magnet the pacemaker will go back to what it was set to be for the patient and the ICD will then start sensing the rhythm okay so people have asked well aren't you going to damage the magnet or the uh, pacemaker and the ICD in the patient no absolutely not the magnet will not uh, there's like a little switch inside the uh, pacemaker uh, and when the magnet is set on top, it just triggers the switch. It doesn't damage or hurt the, mag the uh, pacemaker or the ICD whatsoever. All right, so that's some common myths that need to be squashed. Okay, you're not going to do any harm to this device that's in that patient uh, by placing the donut magnet on. All right, consideration for pacemaker dependent patients um, electromagnetic interference is likely, use the magnet. 
Uh, what we want to stress there is, is this magnet is very strong, okay? So if you have smartphones, if you have the new LifePak 15s, even some of the 12s, be very careful that this magnet does not get placed on top of them. Uh, our recommendation is when we get these magnets out to the medic units, put them on the ceiling. They will stick just like on a refrigerator. Put them right onto the ceiling and let them stay there until you need them. All right, do not lay them on top of the cardiac monitor. Do not place them next to your cell phone because it's just like any other magnet, credit card, stuff like that, and it'll wipe it clean. All right, so be very careful with these magnets and where you're setting them. Um, also, consideration if rate response is programmed on and vibrations are possible. So use the magnet to suspend rate response. Uh, different rate response modes are AAIR, VVIR, DDDR. We'll talk about that in just a second, so don't get caught up on that. Um, this is basically what the EEG looks when you're at the uh, physician or you're at Grand Strand. Uh, you'll notice that the magnet application causes an asynchronous patient pacing at a design magnet rate. And that design magnet rate is what they set at the factory. So your, and this is an example of let's say the patient uh, went in to get a pacemaker placed. He had the pacemaker put in and the cardiologist decided that we're going to set the pace at 70. That's what his normal set settings are going to be. So you place the donut magnet on the patient and you'll notice that the patient in the left started off at 70. You place the magnet on, and now it's marching out at 85 beats per minute. That's letting, does that mean anything for the paramedic in the field? Absolutely not, okay? Just be aware that you're going to see that change. It isn't anything that you did. The increase in rate is not something that should concern you. It's something that is going to happen with the device. What the cardiologists are going to look for is did that increase to 85 or did it drop to 65? If it increased to 85, the pacemaker is still functioning properly, everything's great. If they saw a drop to 65, then there's a possibility that the pacemaker needs to be replaced. There's an issue with them. Okay? Again, has nothing to do with us, but just some FYI information and it's something to look at if you're watching the monitor and you put the magnet on and you see this change. It's nothing to be concerned about, okay? Again, our focus with the donut magnet is the ICD, the defibrillator. That's what we're primarily focusing on. But we have to keep in mind that some of these devices have an ICD and a pacemaker together, okay? So we just need to be aware that this change is going to take place, okay? Now, interaction with ICDs. We know, since what we've been over so far, that the magnet will suspend detection when placed over the device. So it's going to blind it. Okay, the uh, ICD is sitting there attempting all the time to sense the rhythm. Is this patient exercising or is there a lethal rhythm? Okay, what you're going to do is you're going to blindfold it with the magnet. It no longer has the ability to sense. It no longer has the ability to shock the patient. The device may make a tone, some sound, something when you put on the magnet, or it may not make any noise whatsoever. Just be aware it's nothing you did. All right? The magnet does not permanently change the device setting. It just blinds it, not like the pacemaker, where it'll bring it back to a factory setting. The ICD will not change. It'll just blind it. Okay? Magnet use has no effect on the pacing. So don't think that if you look at the monitor and this patient's being shocked and you see a paced rhythm, all right, but yet the patient's being shocked, and you put the magnet. The magnet is not going to affect the pacing rhythm. It may affect the rate that it's pacing, but you're still going to see a paced rhythm on the monitor. So keep that in mind. I'll get into why that's important when we start talking about treatment of the patient. All right? Now, if all else fails, when you remove the magnet, everything goes back to the way it was. ICD is now sensing again. Pacemaker goes back to the rate it was set for the patient and all is good. And again, we just talked about it blinds it. All right, so if you have this rhythm on the strip and the ICD says, whoa, wait a minute, this is not good, I need to shock this patient, it's going to shock the patient. If you have the magnet over top of that ICD, it loses the ability to sense that. All right, why is that important? That's important because if this patient 
calls you because they're getting repeatedly shocked, the first thing you have to determine is the device doing its job or is there a malfunction in the ICD? One of the main malfunctions we're seeing and why this is being pushed is the leads are fracturing. They're finding out that these leads, these new advanced leads that they were putting in the patients are breaking. And what's happening is, is they're rubbing back and forth. Say the patient's putting clothes in the dryer or you know, putting a box on the shelf or something and the leads are rubbing and it's fooling the ICD into thinking that there's a lethal rhythm and it's shocking the patient repeatedly. So what our job is as a paramedic, we're going to do what we always do to patients that are getting shocked. We need to know, is the device doing its job or is there a malfunction? So you're going to treat the patient normally. You're going to put them on the monitor. You're going to assess the patient. You're going to do everything that you would normally do to this patient. If you look on the monitor and you see the rhythm that's shown here, Obviously, the ICD is doing what it's supposed to do, so let it do what it's supposed to do. Do not even reach for the magnet, all right? Let it do its job, and you start treating the patient according to what you would do, regardless whether the ICD was in there or not. Now, if you look on the rhythm strip and you don't see this, you see a normal sinus rhythm or a sinus tack at, say, 120, and you're thinking to yourself, wow, this device should not be shocking this patient, that is when we reach to our toolbox, grab the donut magnet, set it on the patient, and blind it. Now, we have blinded the ICD, so we have got to stay up on our game and constantly assess this patient and constantly be looking at the monitor because if this patient rhythm changes, say he goes from a sinus rhythm or a sinus tack and then all of a sudden goes in the V tack, the ICD no longer has the ability to recognize that. So we have to then say, wait a minute, let me take the magnet off of the patient and allow the ICD to do its job. Okay. All right, as you can see here again, this is a pacemaker with no magnet applied. It's doing just like it's set. It's set at the rate it's supposed to set. You place the magnet on and you can see the rate increase. All right, but you're still seeing the paste rhythm. All right, notice that. Keep that in mind. All right, now, here's a case study. This is basically what started it all, what got us where we're at today and why we're doing it. So in March 16, 2012 at 1120, Merle's Inlet, South Carolina, you got dispatched to an 80-year-old woman with an ICD, uh, removes her clothes from the dryer. During the process, the patient begins to get shocked six times in the first four minutes. The patient then picks up the phone and dials 911 at 1120. The 911 operator dispatches Merle's Inlet, Garland City, Fire Rescue, Medic 77. The paramedic checks en route at 1120. The patient tries to stay still and tries to remain calm until the medics arrive. The patient total receives shocks for 78 in 45 minute time period. Medic 77 checks on the scene at 1125, so we're only talking about five minutes. The patient still at this time has only been shocked six times according to the episode log. Medic said the scene placed the patient on the EKG monitor 1126, which shows a paced rhythm. Patient states that she has a bio uh, V, which is basically an ICD and a pacemaker, implanted at a local hospital. 1127, the patient received six more shocks. So, so far, from 1120 until 1126, or 1127, excuse me, that patient has received 12 shocks. If the medic EMS crew on scene had a magnet and gave the patient the magnet to hold over her device, the shocks would have stopped there. The needless pain would have ended for this patient. Instead, the patient is transported to Waccamaw Hospital and arrives at Waccamaw Hospital 1147. During the transport, the patient received 49 more shocks. That's 49 more shocks in front of the paramedic. Unfortunately, it didn't stop there. Remember, they had to move the patient to the stretcher and make sure the rhythm is being shocked is not VTAC and VFib. If the medic unit was able to hand the patient a magnet, the shocks would have been limited to 12. Instead, the patient received a total of 55 shocks. That's just in the care of the patient. Once they got to the hospital, they received an additional 22 more shocks. So you can see why this has become important to the electrophysiologist, to the cardiologist, and to the device uh, rep because they are concerned until they can get this problem fixed, they don't want to see these patients suffer any more than they have to. So 
They have called upon the medics to get involved and to help them out in getting this patient some relief. So this is just a good example. And what I'm fixing to show you here is what they saw in some of their printouts. Um, again, you can see a lot of this is just a bunch of uh, different settings and readings that they got. But um, it's just some information in case you want it. Uh, again, this is looking at uh, the arrhythmia, how many episodes they had. And you can see, looking at the bottom left, which says page two, uh, all these are the times that this patient received a shock. and Or, excuse me, when they had what the device thought was that rhythm. Notice this patient was in V, or excuse me, this patient was in a paced rhythm. She was not in V-fib, she was not in V-tap. But because the leads had fractured, and they were rubbing, it gave the device the impression that the patient was in V-fib. Right? So you'll notice, let's start at the top, page one here. Um, the patient supposedly went into V-fib and received five shocks at 12.01. All right? If you'll notice, there is a period there between 12.01, or excuse me, between 11.58 and 12.01, the patient didn't receive a shock. So we'll discuss why that's important in a minute, but you can see looking at these time frames that the patient, again, was just needlessly getting shocked and it was not recognizing the proper rhythm because of the lead fracture. Now, we were able to pull off of our um, computers here the actual rhythm strips that uh, Merle's in the Garden City had put on to CodeStat. So you can see at 1126, this patient's going along just fine. Um, they took an NIBP here. And the stars will show you that the patient's receiving a shock. So everything's good here. Again, he received his first shock at 1127. And the rhythm went right back to what it was supposed to be. Here's some more shocks. Again. And here we go. So... It just basically goes over, and this is a device episode. Again, this is all information that the electrophysiologist is using. Uh, some of you may have uh, knowledge of this. Maybe you've worked in the cath lab and had the opportunity to see this. But again, this is just showing you some FYI information of the device itself okay, and what they're seeing. Now, magnet placement. How do we actually treat the patient? Um, other than this PowerPoint presentation, I'm actually going to have a video put out of how it looks and how we're actually going to put this on the patient. So when the magnet is needed for a device, have the patient hold the magnet. This is very important. You're going to see, if you do any research on this, you're going to notice that a lot of times the research is telling you to tape the magnet. Um, that is old literature. Uh, talking with the cardiologist and the electrophysiologist and the rep, that is no longer a recommendation. I have brought this attention to the state. They've agreed that that needs to be changed. So if you look at the state protocols and the state policy, they actually have a policy for uh, donut magnet therapy. And in that donut magnet therapy, it's going to tell you to tape the device to the patient. The electrophysiologist and the cardiologist have stressed to me not to do that. The reason is this. The paramedic needs to be focused on treating the patient and keeping an eye on that monitor and treating the monitor and the patient accordingly. The only purpose of this magnet is to alleviate the needless pain of being shocked to the patient. So if you place the magnet on the patient and then you find that the patient is actually going into a lethal rhythm, the goal is, is that if the patient is holding the magnet themselves, and they go into a lethal rhythm, odds are they'll become altered, they'll become weak, and they'll let go of the magnet. If the patient is unable to let go of the magnet or doesn't go unresponsive, you can grab the magnet and get it off of the patient. It does not need to be taped. All right? Allow the patient to hold the magnet themselves all right? so that, number one, they're in control of what's going on, and also it frees your hands up to treat accordingly. Um, to monitor the patient, to do your 12 lead, to transmit that 12 lead to the hospital. If you have to give medications for the patient, all that stuff can be done because your hands are free and the patient uh, has control of the magnet. Uh, and again, I just mentioned if the patient has an arrhythmia, the patient will lose consciousness, possibly, and the magnet will fall off uh, the device, allowing therapies to be given. 
If the magnet does not fall off and the patient passes out, remove the magnet immediately. The patient is in total control of the magnet at all times. Taping the magnet is discouraged in case a patient has a lethal arrhythmia. So this is not something that we're doing. This is not DHEC. This is coming straight from the cardiologists and electrophysiologists. And Dr. Gobel is saying, do not, under no circumstances, tape that magnet to the patient. VT storm. Uh, there are times when a patient is appropriately receiving multiple shocks, and this is called VT storm. The patient has an underlying problem causing the VT storm, and the patient needs the ICD. Do not place a magnet over the device when the patient is in a VT storm. What they're saying is, is you get called or dispatched to a patient that is receiving shocks from his ICD. Your primary mission as the paramedic is to determine is this patient receiving shocks appropriately? Is the IC doing its job? Or is there a malfunction with the ICD and they're getting inappropriately shocked? That is your goal. How do you do that? Just like you always do to any patient. Cardiac monitor, 12 lead, IV, oxygen, the whole nine. All right. Look at the monitor. Get your 12 lead. Say, okay, the 12 lead is showing normal sinus or a sinus tack. This patient should not be receiving shocks from a defibrillator. Transmit that EKG and 12 lead to the hospital so they can see that and put the magnet on top of the patient. If you look down and the patient is in VTAC or having runs of VTAC, then the device is doing its job. Do not interfere with the device. Let it do what it was designed to do. Don't reach for the magnet. Leave it hanging up on the ceiling and treat your patient just like you would if the patient was in VTAC. You're going to be looking at you know, amiodarone, you're going to be looking at possibly shocking the patient on top of the ICD. You're going to continue to treat this patient like you would normally treat this patient. The only time the donut magnet should come into play is if the patient is being shocked inappropriately and you want to blind the ICD. Okay, so I hope everybody understands that. I've had a few incidents where people have come in and said, hey, I've had this call, um, you know, I, I can't wait for this donut magnet to come out because we could have used it here. I'll actually give you a case scenario here in a second of when that occurred and when we should not have used the magnet. Right. Here we go. Station 2, Medic 2 responds to a cardiac arrest on Highway 17 in Little River. Medic 2 gets on the scene and notices a patient down next to his truck. Seconds after arriving, they discover the patient is receiving shocks by his ICD. The patient was placed on the monitor and the EKG showed VTAC. The patient was transported to Seacoast for stabilization and then transferred to Grandstrand. All right. As you can see here, this is what they printed off at the hospital. And we've circled down here 65 shocks this patient received. Now you'll notice off to the side, 43 of them failed. And what that's saying is, is it shocked the VTAC, but it didn't convert, okay? Alert, uh, right ventricular lead goes into all the uh, criteria, and this is just information that it gave to the cardiologist. But what we need to know is this patient received 46 shocks for VTAC and VFib. The question is, was it appropriate or was it inappropriate? And from what we saw from the report, the patient was getting, the ICD was working. It was doing what it was designed to do. All right, and here's all the uh, episodes and times that they were shocked. And it even shows you the joule settings for the shock. Now notice, um, we'll start down here at, say, 2113. You notice that patient received 25 joules. Keep that in the back of your mind, that joule setting, because I'll just show you in a second why that's important to know. Uh, and this is, again, what the electrophysiologist uses to determine was the IC doing what he said it to do. All right. And you can see the rhythm here. The patient's in v, VTAC. Uh, he's moving along. He gets shocked by the ICD. Continues to go into VTAC. Gets shocked again. You can see it in the top left of the screen and down in the bottom strip. Uh, continues to get shocked. And again, this is the strip all the way to the hospital. So, now let me get back to a question that was asked of me. <clears throat> and I even asked this question to the rep myself. Uh, so don't feel like uh, it's a weird question to ask. The question I asked was, is if the ICD is shocking the patient, as in this scenario at Station 2, 
is it appropriate for me to place the defibrillator pads on this patient and shock them as well? Or should I allow the ICD to do its job? The question is this. Yes, you want the answer is this. So you want to shock that patient. You're going to treat that patient just like you would any other patient, whether they had an ICD or not. You notice in the ICD it was only shocking the 25 joules. Because of the closeness to the heart, and that's a whole other lecture on why it only shocks the 25 joules and why the cardiologist and the electrophysiologist set it to that. Obviously, in this case here, the ICD is not shocking efficiently to convert the VTAC. Okay? Remember we talked about zones earlier in the thing. It's only set for a certain zone. So it's setting itself and sensing and saying, okay, this is VTAC. I've looked at my template, and this is the ICD talking to itself. I looked at my template. This patient meets the criteria of VTAC. I need to shock this patient. My settings are at 25 joules, and it shocks. It may not be efficient enough joules to convert. So you need to jump in just like you would anybody else in VTAC. All right, that's in cardiac arrest. You're going to put your pads on, and you're going to shock this patient. Okay. Again, let me reiterate everybody from what I've said in the beginning. Nothing's going to change in the treatment that you give this patient. We're still going to be giving the awesome, high-quality, high-intensity training that Ori County Fire and Rescue gives to their patients every day. The only reason this cardiac magnet is coming into play is the patient that is getting needlessly shocked we can alleviate the pain of receiving 65, 77 shocks, all right? That is obviously painful to the patient. You're going to be improving their quality of life by not letting them get shocked, just like the Merle's Inlet patient. We could have saved that patient only 12 shocks uh, and, and saved that patient a lot of pain and route to the hospital. So that's the purpose of the cardiac magnet. Okay, so let's go further. My question for this case study is this. Uh, is this a patient you should have hold the magnet? Am I going to look at the cardiac arrest patient and say, here, hold this magnet? Obviously not if he's in cardiac arrest. Number one, he can't hold it. But number two, he's in VTAC. He needs the ICD. And remember, if we place the magnet on top of the ICD, it's going to blind it. It's not going to be able to treat the VTAC. So no, we do not want to put this magnet on the patient. All right? Is this device an ICD or pacemaker? Good question. All right? It's definitely an ICD. All right, because it is shocking the patient accordingly. We did not see a paced rhythm on there. We saw a VTAC. Is the ICD working appropriately? Yes. It was obviously shocking the patient when they got there. They could see the shocks being delivered on the monitor. So awesome job for the ICD. Awesome job for the medic crew that took care of this patient. Excellent. Uh, a little tidbit of information that I want to put out there about this call uh, is that when they got to the hospital, there was talk about putting the cardiac magnet on there and the crew did an excellent job because of their knowledge in saying no I don't think we need to put this patient on a cardiac magnet stop the device from working let it do its job so awesome to the crew uh, at station two um, it was good enough and recognized and again Dr. Goebel uh, is using your case study for this presentation so excellent job again to the guys out there in the field what should you do for this patient Again, you're going to treat this patient under the VTAC protocol, under the cardiac arrest protocol. Uh, nothing changes. That's the beauty of this device. You know, it's, it's only going to improve the quality of life for our patients. It's not going to change anything we do. Um, so just keep that in mind. So let's review for a second. You know, we've talked about a lot of information on here. Um, let's just review everything that we've gone over. Which device is shock? We know that it'd be in the ICD. Okay, your, your um, pacemakers are going to deliver slight shocks to get the pace to rhythm, but your ICD are ultimately going to be devices of shock. Placing a magnet over the uh, pacemaker has what effect? It makes it asynchronous, which means it puts it back to the settings that the factory placed on that pacemaker. Remember we talked about if they were... Uh, if the electrophysiology set it at 70 uh, and you put the donut magnet over the pacemaker, it would either jump it to 85 if the pacemaker was good, or if it dropped to 65, it would be an indication to the cardiologist that the pacemaker needs to be replaced. All right? Placing the magnet over the ICD has what effect? It blinds it. It puts a blindfold over the ICD, so it cannot sense 
the rhythm that's going on with that patient. So be very cautious about placing the donut magnet over until you've determined that this patient is getting shocked appropriately or not getting shocked appropriately based on the rhythm we see on the monitor. All right. Can a patient have repeated shocks and it be true VTAC and VFib? Yes. All right. The patient can have repeated shocks. Usually what happens is, is the pacemaker or the, excuse me, the ICD will start shocking the patient and it will have a set amount of shocks that it's going to try. All right. Um, just like when we look at our protocol, you know, if we have a patient in VTAC, we're going to shock the patient and we immediately go back into CPR. The ICD works kind of the same way. It's going to set the shocks and then it's going to go back and reevaluate. Did it effectively convert to VTAC? And then if it didn't, it's going to say, okay, well, maybe I need to increase my joules. So it's going to go back and it's going to shock again. So at a different amount. So maybe you noticed on some of the uh, PowerPoints earlier, you saw five shocks. And then it took a little break, and then it shocked at six. That's what it's doing. It's reevaluating what's going on. How should the magnet be placed on the patient? Remember, by orders of Dr. Gobel, by orders of the um, manufacturers of the ICDs, by orders of the electrophysiologist, you must have the patient hold the magnet themselves. You are going to hand the patient the magnet and say, place this over your device. Okay? I promise you. From what I've heard from talking to these people, after getting shocked 12 times by this thing, the patient will have no problems grabbing that uh, magnet and holding it over their device. It will also give them a sense of control because before that, they had no control. The guy that was getting shocked with the uh, putting his clothes in the dryer, sitting at the house, trying to stay still. Can you imagine the anticipation of wondering, am I going to get shocked again? Oh my, I don't want to move. So... This is going to reassure the patient. It's going to get them relaxed. They're going to be able to have control over what's going on with them. Okay. So in a nutshell, guys, again, there's a video coming out where I'm actually going to show you how this is going to all play out in the back of an ambulance. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Um, call the main number for County kind of Fire and Rescue and Kathy can get up with me. Um, my cell phone number is 252 917-7024. Please give me a call if you have any questions. I, I really want this to work out and become a um, very good thing for Wake County Fire and Rescue. Uh, also, let me stress to the crews out there, if you have this patient, once the magnets are put out, please keep in mind that you need to document when you put the magnet on the patient. Uh, you need to also transmit the EKG immediately to the doctor. I will be sending out uh, the new protocols to all the stations so that they can actually view the protocol and see what needs to take place. Uh, the other thing that uh, the Dr. Gobel stressed to me was is when you have the patient on the stretcher, make sure that the patient is sitting at least 70 degrees. Okay, And then, again, you hand them the cardiac magnet to place on the patient. I will be sending this PowerPoint I will be sending the um, protocol that's going to be placed in our protocols out to the stations. I will also be putting out a video on um, the website so that we can look at it. So you can actually see how this is all going to play on, how easy this is. But if you have any questions, please feel free to call me uh, and I'd be glad to answer them. Also, the day of the docs that we got set up for April. We're going to have Ryan from Medtronic. We're also going to have Dr. Gobel there. They're going to be doing a lecture on this. So if you need more information or want to get some more information from them, when those dates are set out, I believe they're April 14th or 15th or 15th and 16th, I'm not real sure. When you see it come out, attend, and you can have the opportunity to get more information and get questions from them. This slide right here, which is the last slide we're having, uh, it's just some information of the different devices and their numbers. Uh, so if you want to research some of them, Medtronic, um, St. Jude, Biotronic, ELA, all these, you can look at um, their devices online. They even give out information because, again, it's not just a Medtronic issue. It's a global issue. All these devices that are using these type of wiring, they're failing. So, you know, you may not have a Medtronic. Uh, so if the question is, you know, if I have a biotronic pacemaker in there, can I still use the donut magnet that Medtronic put out? Yes. 
All the devices, even though they may be a different company, they may be designed a different way, all of them will benefit from the magnet and all of them will work the same or have the same effect with the magnet placed on it. So if there's no other further questions, um, thank you for listening to me. Uh, and I'm really excited and, and hope that this becomes a successful project that we can be proud of. And again, guys out in the field and girls, thanks for what you do. Thank you for making this a success. And um, I look forward to working with y'all. Thank you. My name is Patrick Ellis. This is the world-renowned Shaq Wisely. <laughs> he is going to be our patient today. And what we're going to be going over is the use and protocol of the cardiac donut magnet. And he gets the name because it's shaped just like a donut magnet. Now, some things I need to put out, some warnings is this thing is uh, a very strong magnet. Uh, when you get them and play with them, you'll see that. So it needs to stay away from the LifePak 12s, especially the LifePak 15s, or it will erase it. It also needs to stay away from any cell phones. So my suggestion is, if you have some of the older ambulances, you could probably put it on the ceiling. If not, you can take some sort of device and hang it from the rail so that it is accessible when needed. All right. It's very simple. The protocol states that if you have a patient that is calling you because they're being needlessly shocked uh, by their uh, defibrillator, their ICD, the first thing you got to do is confirm that it is needless shocks or inappropriate shocks. You want to make sure the patient is not actually in a shockable rhythm. So everything that you would normally do for this patient, you would do. IV O2 monitor, you put them on the monitor, you look to see what their rhythm is. If it's a rhythm that is associated with the ICD, uh, for example, if they are in VTAC or VFib or something like that, you would treat the patient accordingly. You would not even reach for this. If it is a paced rhythm and the patient has an ICD pacemaker combination, the patient is the monitor, or excuse me, the ICD and the are doing what it's supposed to do. Leave this alone. Okay. If you look on the monitor and you see a normal sinus rhythm or rhythm that would not normally be shocked then and the patient is still getting shocked you need to take this into play so the first thing that um, Dr. Gobel wants us to do is instruct the patient on how to use this so you would tell the patient this is a donut magnet find the device and I want you to hold the magnet on the device it is important to have the patient hold the magnet that way your hands are free if you need to grab medication if you need to do a 12 lead Anything else that needs to go on, you can do it. If the patient, for some reason, goes into a shockable rhythm and becomes altered, Dr. Goebel said most likely he would pass out or become unresponsive, and they would drop the magnet. Once this magnet comes off of the ICD, the ICD, again, is, becomes no longer blinded, and it is going to start reacting to what's going on. Now, this still, again, does not change. Take the donor magnet, set it aside, if they are in VTAC, treat the VTAC. Do everything that you would normally do based on your appropriate protocol. And let the ICD do what it's supposed to do. Um, that's basically it, cut and dry. So there's been two videos put out. One will be the first one over the um, PowerPoint presentation that was put out by Medtronic. The second one is this one where we're going over the proper use of the cardiac magnet. I will also be putting out Dr. Martel's protocol so please make sure that you look over these and become very familiar with them so we can hopefully roll this out and be successful. Thank you.